Um, and then civil war was really after 9-11, the question I needed to ask was, none of my landscape painters who are charged with painting democratic values and kind of nature as a patriotic, spiritual, cultural icon for what makes America better than so many other countries like monarchies, they're not painting the war. Most of them aren't in uniform. So what are they doing? And the common wisdom in the field was, well, they were up in the Catskills and the Adirondacks painting nature, painting sanctuary for a war-weary nation. And after 9-11, I thought, please tell me they had more of a social conscience than that. Because to me, the planes hitting the Twin Towers was our century's version of Fort Sumter. That was the shock that that you know wove through the country. We've never really recovered from it. And I think that it set me to thinking about, well, how do I channel that when we try to understand the impact that the Civil War had on Americans in the middle of the 19th century? So I'm watching flags waving everywhere, and then church paints our banner in the sky, and it's a flag waving in a painting. So I thought, okay, they're using their art symbolically, metaphorically, in support of the Union cause, or the Confederate cause in the case of Conrad Wise Chapman. And so it was really a deep dive into how do you get back into the mindset of the mid 19th century so that this isn't an absence because a lot of art history when you read it is well this happened before the war and this happened after the war but it's like we had four years of collective amnesia during the war and so i wanted to find out what do you paint before you know how it ends mm -hmm. you don't have the meta narrative you don't have the complete arc and so the big questions were, well, what happens next? How long is it going to last? Who wins? Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Mm -hmm. And so really that exhibition was about trying to address those questions. And ironically, for my Humboldt exhibition, Alexander von Humboldt kept popping up in every single one of my shows. Um, he was writing about the synergy between art and nature and the need for scientists to view nature with wonder and artists to view nature through a scientist's eye. You need to know what kind of rocks are those? What kinds of trees are those? Did you get your mountains right? You know, is it real? Do you really know what you're painting? And all of those landscape painters wanted to be naturalists in addition to artists. So Humboldt folded his way into my early work that way. Then it turns out he's an abolitionist, a big fan of American democracy, and he supports um, John C. Fremont's campaign against James Buchanan for the US presidency, um, and then throws up his hands in despair after 50 years of trying to hammer on us that we had to get rid of slavery in order to live up to our ideals. And so after that project, I, I kind of thought, well, what's next? And I said, you know, this guy keeps lurking in all of my projects, what happens if we actually bring him out into the spotlight? And that's when I discovered, oh my God, he made it to the United States in 1804. He meets Thomas Jefferson, which is the point of coming here. The two of them geek out about the fact that it's nature and science that will set America apart. He basically says, you can't build your way to significance. You know, think about the you know, the the uh, all of the seven wonders of the world. It's like, no, 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 no. He said, you have natural monuments, play to your strengths. And that's when Jefferson, through Notes on the State of Virginia, which he's already written, doubles down on Niagara Falls, on Natural Bridge. He sends Lewis and Clark out west. And so every expedition brings back a new national treasure. And eventually what we get is the national park system. And so to me, it's humble incentivizing and encouraging Jefferson to do what Jefferson is already doing. Um, and I think that sets the tone for why landscape painting becomes so important to the United States and its cultural identity. Mm -hmm. I think it's the underlying reason so many of us get dragged to national parks as little kids because we're on a pilgrimage and we don't know it. We're actually looking to find ourselves. And so to me, all of my projects are kind of, it's like coming full circle. They are like each is a capstone project based on the one before. And I love that because I think that it puts me in a position I really appreciate, which is the opportunity 
to take a deep dive into things that I really care about and then have something to say that has less to do with me and more to do with what we can understand about ourselves, our culture, our country, and the land. Uh, Thomas Cole, Frederick Church, Sanford Gifford, John Kensett, they're all reading Humboldt. Um, Church goes to South America twice, and he and Cyrus Field, a friend of his who goes with him on the first trip, they're literally it's on a fanboy tour. Um, they are reading Humboldt by firelight at night. They are following his treks during the day. Church is keeping a diary. Um, they are staying in the same haciendas. And Humboldt in South America is a lot like George Washington here. So if you go to Peru or Ecuador, Colombia or Venezuela, where Humboldt went, you will find a lot of places advertising that this is where Humboldt stayed. Um, and there, there's a painting in our collection of Cotopaxi with a hacienda in the foreground and two travelers making their way toward it. And that is the hacienda church stayed in and it's the hacienda Humboldt stayed in 50 years earlier. My, my project starts small uh, and then they balloon. And so Civil War took um, six and a half years and as I was wrapping up Civil War in 2013, I had already started to think about Humboldt. So from 2013 to 2020, um, seven-ish, eight years, partly because what I've discovered is that oftentimes when we embark on a research project, we realize we've bitten off more than we can chew. Um, the deadlines are already on the calendar. Um, publications already knows when to expect a manuscript. There's no walking that back. So you have two choices. You can speed up and go deep, or you can scale back and trim and do something smaller. And I tend to speed up and go deep. Um, so it will often take me the first two years to figure out what the exhibition is really about. I can wave my arms and say, it's about Humboldt. And no one will know what I'm talking about, least of all me. I just know I'm onto something, but I don't know what I'm onto yet. And that's where... I think of the way I do art history as forensic archaeology. It is like taking a painting or a person or a, a diary and saying, what's going on here? If you were here in front of me, what questions would I ask? Where would I go to find the evidence? Who are the witnesses that are missing? Um, and they lead you to other questions. And so I feel as though it's a kind of investigative art history. And that takes time. And sometimes you want to wrap it up fast, but then you have a sneaking suspicion you're not telling the right story. Um, mm -hmm. You're leaving something critical out. And so, you know, for me, when I sit down to write, um, usually it's about 18 months ahead of the publication date and the exhibition. That's often the start of the last um, deep dive into the research, because there's nothing like starting to write to make you realize what you don't think you can say yet. You know, you write a declarative sentence and then you go, oh, can I actually support that? And then you start diving back into your resources until you convince yourself, yes, I have the footnote. Now we can move on. So it's a, it's a cyclical process. It's not linear. I don't just sit down and write. And as soon as I finish milking one article, I set it aside. It It's, it's a constant loop. And so it in and of itself is its own mini research project within a much larger research project. And frankly, I just really love doing that. And I'm lucky enough to be working at the Smithsonian where they are willing to encourage that mm -hmm. instead of saying, trim it down, cut it back, stay on the surface, it'll be fine.